All right, so I need a little bit of audience participation this morning. Quick show of hands. How many of you consider yourselves to be a great judge of character? Let me see your hands. Okay, I, yeah, you can spot a fool, a fake, or a fraud 100 yards away, no problem. You, you know about that person's character. You know their strengths and weaknesses. You know how they like their coffee, and you've never even had a conversation with them. You are that good. And I recognize that because I'm the same way. That's exactly my mindset. All right, let's find out whether or not everybody's going to be honest this morning. How many of you have ever been wrong? Let me see your hands. There you go. We got some honest people. When I'm talking about being wrong, I'm, I'm not talking about like a little off. I'm, I'm talking way off. Like you, you pegged some poor guy, to, guy as a player first time he walked in the room. It was his smile, how he dressed, how he carried himself. And then later on, you find out he's been happily married for 36 years. Teaches weekend to remember retreats for other couples. Has three books on the sacredness of marriage. But listen, even though your initial judgment doesn't line up with the facts, you're not wrong, you're just early. You're thinking to yourself, he's just not been caught yet. <laughs> Give it time, he'll show his true colors. You, you see, it's amazing how as people, we can judge other people and we can draw conclusions without all the facts. We can make wild accusations about somebody's character or their spiritual depth based on impressions, based on feelings, based on who they associate with, based on what they do. And watch out. Here's another one. This is ugly. Based on who they vote for. Yeah, I said it. I said it. And, and I, I recognize there has to be something right in the idea of if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Okay, I, I get that. What I'm talking about is seeing a feather and knowing it's a duck. I'm, I'm talking about you don't even need to know how it looks or how it walks or how it quacks. That is irrelevant because in your gut, you just know about that person. That is called a snap judgment, and those snap judgments can hurt a lot of things. Now, ironically, we hate it when somebody does the same thing to us. We hate it when people think they know us or they make an opinion about us or they label us based on who they think we are, and it doesn't represent who we are. And we're quick to tell people, that's not me. You don't know me. You don't know my story. You don't know my journey. You don't know what I stand for. You can't judge me. We hate it when other people judge us. Years ago, if there were one verse in the Bible that would be known by Christians and non-Christians alike, it's probably the most quoted verse and recognizable quote, it would have probably been John 3.16. People had t-shirts, they had it on hats, they would write it on boards, hold it up in ball games. John 3.16. Today, if there was ever a passage, it's probably the most recognized passage in the Bible. It's now probably Matthew 7.1. Judge not, lest you be judged. People don't have to know anything else about the Bible, but they know somewhere in the Bible it says something about not judging other people. In our text today, Jesus confronts a crowd that was judging him. And he shows that their unrighteousness had skewed their judgment. Their sin had disabled their ability to assess the situation accurately. And not only that, they thought they had figured him out. They thought they knew his character. They thought they knew his mindset. They thought they understood his motives. And they were dead wrong. I mean, they were so far off the mark. And that's one of those huge issues when it comes to snap judgments. We don't know what we don't know, but we act like we know something. And it gets us into trouble. Snap judgments can assassinate somebody's reputation. It can spread lies and gossip and slander. It can destroy marriages and families. Snap judgments can divide churches and communities and countries. And here's the thing about a snap judgment. Even down the road, if you find out what you initially thought is not correct, you still will never see that person the same way again. Those snap judgments sit down in our spirit. So in our text today, we find in John 7 that not only do snap judgments do all of those things, but we can also see how snap judgments distort our view of God and can further propel a person down a path of destruction. 
We're going to work our way through the story this morning. We're going to see how unrighteous judgment distorts everything. And here's what I'm going to encourage you to do today. And it's going to be hard. I recognize it's not a fun endeavor. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. When I'm praying in just a moment, I want you to pray and ask God, where in my life is a judgmental spirit destroying relationships, distorting truth, fostering pride, and dishonoring God? Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? All right, let's, uh, let's go in our Bibles. John chapter 7, we're going to be in verses 19 through 24. I'm speaking this morning on the subject, the dangers of a judgmental spirit. And by the way, before we get into this, just know like for the first five verses, it does not sound like he's even talking about judgmentalism or anything like that. It's a dialogue that he has, and at the end, he caps it off in verse 24, bringing in this idea of judgment. So let's look in our Bibles, verse 19 through 24. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who seeks to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one deed, and you all marvel. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision, not because it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask today that our minds would be pulled to truth. God, I pray for each of us in the room right now. Help us to see where in our lives a judgmental spirit is destroying relationships, distorting truth, fostering pride, and dishonoring you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, throughout the Bible, we find that there are warnings showing us how sin and hypocrisy as well as foolishness accompany snap judgments, and specifically when it is judgments against someone else. I've included just a handful of these in your notes so that you'll have some to look back at later on. Proverbs 18.31 says, spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. When somebody vents, when they judge a situation, they verbalize that judgment out loud without listening to the facts. God calls that foolish, and he calls it shameful. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Jesus says, judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Very clear, he's telling us not to judge others. James chapter 4, verse 12. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? There's only one judge that judges God. He has not like stepped off the throne. He's not given us opportunity to judge in his place. There's only one. It says, who are you to judge your neighbor? Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, Jesus tells people to remove the log out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out of your brother's. In so doing, he's helping us see that to focus on someone else's faults without first dealing with the issues in our own life is hypocritical. Finally, John chapter 8, verse 7. This is going to be what we get to when we go a little bit further down the road in our study of the Gospel of John. It's the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, and there's a group wanting to stone her. And Jesus says, the one who is without sin, be the first to throw a stone at her. Once again, he's saying that hypocrisy is looking at others, pointing out their faults, judging them, when you yourself also have faults and sins in your life. Now, somebody might say, Paul, I get all of that. But what about verse 24? What about verse 24? Because Jesus said in verse 24, judge with righteous judgment. That sounds like not all judgment is wrong. Some is right. And you know how we determine righteous and unrighteous judgment? Whether we said it. If I say it, it's righteous judgment. If you do it, that's unrighteous judgment. Okay, also, what about 1 Corinthians 2.15, where it says the spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. Hey, Paul, I'm spiritual. I get to judge others, and others can't judge me based on what that says. 
Or what about 1 Corinthians 5, 12, and 13, when Paul said, For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church, but those who are outside, God judges? All right, Paul, at the very least, I get to judge other Christians. He says, you you judge the ones in the church, let God judge the ones outside the church. So how do we make this fit together? How do they work in harmony? The answer is always found in context, in context, in context. 1 Corinthians 5, Paul is addressing a church that was unwilling to confront known sin. There was a guy in the church claiming to be a Christian who was sleeping with his father's wife. And his actions were known by everyone, but no one would call him out on the sin. They didn't have a problem with randomly judging people. They had a problem with Christians not judging sin. His sin was known. God had already given judgment on that sin. And they were unwilling to deal with that. So Paul says, you are to remove that guy from your midst. Okay, that's a different context. How about 1 Corinthians 2.15? It actually addresses how unbelievers do not understand the truths of God, but believers understand the truths of God because we have the Spirit of God indwelling us. So then in the very next verse is where it says that unbelievers cannot judge believers Because they don't understand who believers are. That's why it says that the Christian is to be judged by no one. It's it's not talking about the same kind of judgment. It's dealing with the fact that people who do not understand the things of God will never be able to accurately assess someone who is living according to the things of God. So what about verse 24? When Jesus says, judge with righteous judgments. Okay, how do we take that? What do we do with that particular text? I'm going to give that answer after we get all the way through the text. So let's look at where this story is going. That is, in order to really get our minds around what's happening in this text, you have to remember some of what we covered this last week. If you were not here last week, here's like your 35-second recount. That is, we talked about looking at the source. Whenever you hear Bible teaching, how do you know if it is from God or how do you know if it's of somebody's personal opinion? And the issue is go back to the source. Look at the source. It's easy to label everyone who teaches something different or believes something different as a false teacher or a false prophet or a heretic or spiritually deceived. We can make snap judgments about somebody based on just a little bit of information. That's the reason I said last week our goal is not to foster a critical spirit. Our goal is to develop a discerning mind. It is vitally important that believers understand biblical truth and they walk in accordance with that truth. And it's also incredibly important that we don't begin to look down on and be judgmental of someone else because the first thing that happens is we get built up with pride and we fall into a similar trap. So in verses 19 through 24, the crowd is judging Jesus. And at the end of the exchange is when he actually brings up the phrase, do not judge according to appearance. Don't judge based on what's on the outside. Or the way we would say it today is, don't judge a book by its cover. And then he goes on to say, but judge with righteous judgment. Here's a good truth to hold on to. Jesus doesn't forbid discernment. He forbids judgmentalism. So to get the flow of where this is going, look back up into verse 18. Let's reread the last verse that we dealt with this last week. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true. And here it is. And there is no unrighteousness in him. Did you notice how he and him are both capitalized at the end of verse 18? The reason is Jesus is talking about himself. He's saying that he is true, that there is no unrighteousness in him. But now he's about to point out there is unrighteousness in the crowd. Here's how he says it in verse number 19. Did not Moses give you the law and yet none of you carries out the law? In other words, if you break the law, it means you're unrighteous. 
If you obey the law, at least there's a form of righteousness. The Jews absolutely loved the law of Moses. They wanted to obey the law of Moses. Many sought the law of Moses as a way of personal salvation. If I keep it, I'm right with God. I'm saved before God. But the issue is no one could fully obey the law of Moses. No human could do that. So the reason is the law was given to reveal sin It was never given to save sinners. Another way of saying it would be, the law is a great mirror to show you the dirt in your life. But it is a poor bar of soap to wash it off. You can see it, but it doesn't empower you to remove it. We find, according to the New Testament, that no one is saved by keeping the law. Romans 3, Galatians 3, Galatians 5. So here's Jesus' logic. Their disobedience to the law revealed their unrighteousness. His fulfillment of the law displayed his righteousness. So it was a situation of an unrighteous crowd trying to judge the righteous son of God. And he says, you've not even kept the law. And then he brings up this next statement. Why do you seek to kill me? And they were taken back by the question. In fact, you can tell by their response that they had little to no understanding of what their leader's plot was against Jesus, to kill Jesus. We can see that because they're, they're like, who's trying to kill you? They're, it's a crowd that is not uh, in, in understanding with what their leaders are trying to do. But even though they didn't know what their leaders were trying to do, it didn't mean that they didn't make a snap judgment in the moment. So he said, why are you trying to kill me? Their first response is, you have a demon. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, let's find out more of what Jesus is talking about. No, let's ask some questions and see where he's coming from. There's none of that. Their initial assessment is, he has a demon. Now that statement, you have a demon, could be taken two ways. It could be taken in a very literal sense that he was actually demonically possessed, or it could also be taken in that culture figuratively to describe someone who is paranoid, somebody who is insane, somebody who is out of their mind. So take either approach. They're either saying Jesus is demon-possessed, or they're saying Jesus is insane and out of his mind. Now, you talk about missing the mark. Let this one sink in. They claimed That God, in the flesh, was demon-possessed. Talk about a snap judgment in missing it completely. Their further response affirms the unrighteousness of their heart, as well as we see that they resented his allegations that they had not kept the law of Moses. Now, Jesus just brushes off their remark, and he keeps going, and he provides a prime example of how they did not keep the law of Moses. He said in verse 21, I did one deed, and you all marvel. In verses 22 and 23, he clarifies that that one deed was his healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda back in chapter 5. And he said, I I did one thing, and you all marvel with that. Now, that one deed would have been sufficient proof that he was who he claimed to be. He was not crazy. He was not demon-possessed. He was not just a good man. He was not just a great teacher. Rather, he is the Son of God sent by the Father. That one deed should have been sufficient, and yet they rejected that one deed. And they go on from there not only to reject it, but to begin to plot to kill him. Chapter 5, verse 18. Now, I recognize it's been six to seven months since we were in chapter 5, so here's the quick snapshot of what happened in that scene. Jesus heals a man who had been sick for 38 years at the pool of Bethesda, but he did it on a Sabbath. And the people, the religious leaders who saw this, they said, you got six other days that you could heal. Why are you bypassing Sabbath regulations and healing this man on the Sabbath? And Jesus defended his actions back then by saying that he was equal with the Father. Chapter 5, verse 16. That's when they begin to plot to kill him. Now he brings up that exact same example once again. This time... He points out their misinterpretation of Sabbath regulations 
But he points it out in a very specific example. He talks to him about circumcision. And he says, you all have been abiding by the law of Moses. And the law of Moses is one that records the command of circumcision. But it wasn't Moses who actually came up with the command. It was actually Abraham, Genesis 17, back in the patriarchal period. So even though Moses recorded the command, it was given prior to that. It predated the law of Moses. But here's what they would do. Every male child on the eighth day was to be circumcised. Inevitably, some of those days, the eighth day, fell on the Sabbath. And they would go ahead and they would circumcise the child on the Sabbath. However, according to their understanding of work on the Sabbath, they were believed that unless it was necessary to save a life, Exodus 20 verse 10, they were not to do anything on the Sabbath. So here's the correlation he's making. Look at verse 23. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, which is a form of physical mutilation of one part of the body, he says, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do you see how he pointed out their hypocrisy? He's saying, you're telling me there's a problem in this? On the Sabbath, you can go through and mutilate a part of the body and say you're not breaking Sabbath regulations, but I make an entire man well on the Sabbath, and you're saying I broke Sabbath regulations? Just a thought. Might want to write it off to the side. Legalism always gives birth to hypocrisy. Verse 24. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. That was both an indictment on their lack of moral and theological discernment as well as a plea for them to have both. The harsh self-judgment of legalism is always forbidden by God. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. But also superficial judgment based only on outside appearances is also condemned by God. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7. Jesus is telling the crowds, abandon your misconceptions about him. Abandon the snap judgments about him, but rather judge him based on the facts that have been presented, the teachings that have been shared, the miracles that have been performed. Make your judgment about him based on the facts, based on what actually happened and not based solely upon misconceptions. If there's one big idea, big truth that this entire text would lead us back to, it's simply this. Discern well, judge not. Discern well, judge not. Discern well, judge not. We need moral and theological discernment. We need to rightly evaluate things based on the truths of God's word. We need to know God's word so as to discern whenever things, people, ideas, culture, government, church, theology, anything is offline with God's revealed truth. That is a part of having the mind of God. That is a part of discernment. That is a part of walking in wisdom. But discernment and judgmentalism are two separate things. Judgmentalism looks down on the other person. Judgmentalism assesses a situation without all the facts. Judgmentalism, it flows from an unrighteous, prideful, critical spirit. Judgmentalism is something that slanders reputations and it destroys relationships and it always, always, always dishonors God. So how do you know the difference between the two? How do you know if you're operating in discernment or if you're operating in judgment? Here's a couple of thoughts about discernment, and then I'll give you a couple about judgment in just a moment. First, discernment does not believe everything. Aren't you glad that believing the Bible doesn't have to mean that you're gullible? Discernment does not believe everything. 1 John 4, 1, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. A part of discernment is not believing everything, but testing it. Is it of God? Is it not of God? Also, discernment approves what is excellent and leads to purity and righteousness. This passage has been rocking my world the last several days because every time I read it, there's another thought that comes out of it. 
But here's, here's the reason it's been getting me excited. Philippians 1, 9 and 10. It says, it is my prayer that your love, hold on to this word, love, Why do I bring that up? Why is that exciting to me? Because sometimes people say, I don't need all the facts to just love them. And sometimes what we think is loving someone is toxic charity. Sometimes what we think is helping someone is hurting someone. And we can cover over things by saying, oh, I'm just going to love them. But listen to what the passage says. It says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless before the day of Christ. Here's another one. Discernment is developed through constant practice. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Maybe you don't have a very discerning heart right now. Maybe you fall for a lot of things. There's good news in this. The more you discern right from wrong, good from evil, the more you practice doing that, there is a a level in which a person can get better. They can develop in discernment over the course of time. Here's the next one. Discernment tests everything and holds on to what is good. Our passage literally says the exact same thing. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. But test everything, hold fast to what is good. Now, to live out this passage is going to mean that we have to mentally and spiritually engage. Why do I bring that up? Because we live in a broken, messed up world. And if you're like me, some days I just want to go home and escape the reality of the world that we live in. People like to watch reality program. I'm like, I got too much reality going on in my life right now. I want make-believe. I, I want to live like an extra on Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. I, I want to think everything's going happy around me. But as Christians, we're called to be salt and light. We, can't, we cannot disengage and not think through and spiritually understand what we're called to do. That, that's a part of it for us. Discernment tests everything and it holds on to what is good. And to test everything means you have to engage. Discern well, judge not. Discern well, judge not. Here's several thoughts about judgmentalism and we'll close out. Judgmentalism is birth in unrighteousness. We've already covered this in verses 18 and 19. Judgmentalism, it's birth in unrighteousness. Judgmentalism is ripe with hypocrisy. This has already been covered in verses 21 through 23. A great way to find out whether or not you are discerning or whether or not you are judging other people is to check on your own personal repentance. Are you keeping your obedience up to date? You'll find that hypocrites will condemn in others what they excuse in themselves. Judgmentalism, the third one, looks on the outside and assesses without all the facts. We see this in verse 24. Jesus tells the people, stop judging by external categories, by mere appearances. Their ideas about him were built on misconceptions and erroneous conclusions. They were judging him based on what seems and not judging him based on what is. We have to ask the questions. We have to dig deeper. We, we have to get to what are the facts. That's why it's so important. Whenever you're in a situation where maybe there's hurt feelings between you and somebody else and accusations are flying and you're starting to judge the person, critical spirit is coming up inside. In those moments, it's important that we stop and we go to the person and find out what is true versus what is a misunderstanding. How has the enemy twisted our mind in that moment? There's an old saying that goes like this. The devil is in the details. Satan delights in causing friction and division and destruction. And a part of his strategy to do this is by hiding the details in our hurts. Think about this. When you're hurting, you don't want to think more about that. You don't want to ask the next question. 
You don't want to go talk to the person because they hurt you. You're upset with them. It's uncomfortable. And it's in that hurt, in that confusion, in that time where we don't understand what's happening that the enemy uses that to further bring division. And a lot of that is we make our judgment calls in isolation. This person did that because of this. This person is always doing that to me. I can't believe this person would talk about me like this or whatever. And we are making an entire narrative in our mind that may or may not have any truth as its basis. Don't let the pain keep you from the truth. Here's the last on those. Judgmentalism condemns yourself. Romans 2.1. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Every time you're judging someone else, you're condemning yourself. Now, I recognize as a believer, all of your sins have been covered by the blood of the cross, past, present, and future. This does not mean that you're losing your salvation. What it does mean is that sin always has consequences, and those consequences many times come home to you and to those that are around you. So whenever we are acting in a judgmental, condemning way, it hurts us. It hurts those that are around us. Discern well, judge not. Discern well, judge not. Discern well, judge not. Discernment leads to peace. Judgment leads to problems. Discernment protects you. Judgment condemns you. Discernment is a gift. Judgment is a sin. In our next section, we're going to see how when our judgment was wrong as the basis, every other idea you put on top of it is now also skewed and wrong. So when the foundation is wrong to begin with, every additional assessment you put on top of it keeps leading the person further and further and further away from the truth. So where in your life is a judgmental spirit skewing your perspective, destroying your relationships, and dishonoring God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that each of us would be willing to sit with your word, sit with the, the difficulty of the text, allowing that word to minister deep into us, that the Spirit would show us where in our lives there's something that is not in alignment with what you're saying in this text. God, we recognize that it can be a, a slippery slope between discernment and judgment. Sometimes what starts off really, really well can go really, really bad if we don't take every thought captive. So God, give us the ability, I pray, to have discerning minds. Keep us from having that hypocritical, judgmental, critical spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.